It is good to be together, to come to praise God, to acknowledge that God is in this place as God is in every place. It is good to see each of you, and I welcome you. Welcome especially to visitors, to guests, to friends we haven't seen for a while. Glad to have the Pickens back with us today. And welcome to John Williams, who bears a somewhat resemblance to Richard Williams. I think they might be related. Um, and you can ask each of them if they'll admit it. It's good to have you with us this morning. As we gather together, I do invite you to sign the attendance pads and pass them along the pews. And what announcements do you wish to share this morning? On uh, Saturday, September 8th, my family is going to be participating in a walk for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. It's the Harrisburg Out of the Darkness Walk. Um, if anyone is interested in either walking with us or sponsoring us, uh, you can let us know. See us after church. I appreciate it. And also, tomorrow there are three birthdays in the congregation. Uh, one of them standing up front there. <laughs> and Brenda and Beth Roth. So there will be cake after worship. There are still slots available for the progressive dinner on Saturday night. You have until Thursday to sign up, and we still need a hostess for the main course. Following up on the walk, um, it is an excellent um, opportunity to provide money for a good organization, and they have a a walk that's national, and they start and literally walk into the daylight. It's an all-night walk, so it's pretty pretty powerful for those who could become part of that too. And I need your help. I looked at the flower chart. It's not full. Please help me. Fill it up. <laughs> Many of you are aware that Ken Gibble has written several books, or I know that he's written at least one, but he has a, a recently published book of poetry that I highly recommend um, because he is somewhat modest. I am glad to, to toot his horn. Um, <laughs> there are some, I know that some of you have copies of it, um, but if some of you would like to have copies and get them directly, we have some in the office. Ken has graciously agreed to give a portion of the, the proceeds back to the church. And if you so desire, you might even be willing to autograph them. <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> and would that also be going to the church? <laughs> it is a great book. Um, and so I, I highly recommend taking a look at it. Are there other announcements you wish to share this morning? We are glad that Jake Irwin, um, who recently went on a new community project trip to Denali, um, will be sharing with us in worship a little bit later on. So thank you for going and thank you for helping us to experience it vicariously through your pictures and, and through your sharing. 
If there are no other announcements, let us continue in the spirit of worship. Please rise as you are able. Let your minds ponder the manifold works of God. Let your spirits soar amid the wonders of creation. There is pulsating life all around us. The earth is full of God's creatures. Sun and rain proclaim God's infinite imagination. Moons and stars sing the glory of the Eternal One. It is God who shares with us wisdom and understanding. We depend upon God for the gift of life. We gather to worship and praise the God of all people. We come to learn from the God we only dimly perceive. We reach out for answers to our questions. We long to find meaning and purpose for our days. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have called us to be responsible stewards of all you have created. We have gathered here to praise you for the wonder of your world. As we worship you, inspire us to be a new people, a people of peace, a people of compassion and responsibility toward the earth that you have entrusted to us, a people of wisdom, a people of love, your very own people. Amen. You are clothed in glory and grandeur. 
You wear light like a robe. You open the skies like a curtain. You establish the earth on its foundations so that it will never, ever fail. You covered it with the watery deep like a piece of clothing. The waters were higher than the mountains. But at your rebuke, they ran away. They fled in fear at the sound of your thunder. They flowed over the mountains, streaming down the valleys to the place you established for them. Overhead, the birds in the sky make their home, chirping loudly in the trees. From your lofty house, you water the mountains. The earth is filled full by the fruit of what you've done. You make grass grow for cattle. You make plants for human farming in order to get food from the ground. And wine, which cheers people's hearts, along with oil, which makes the face shine, and bread, which sustains the human heart. Lord, you have done so many things. You made them all so wisely. The earth is full of your creations. And then there's the sea, wide and deep, with its countless creatures, living things both small and large. There go the ships on it, and Leviathan, which you made, plays in it. All your creatures wait for you to give them their food on time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled completely full. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I'm still alive. Let my praise be pleasing to him I'm rejoicing in the Lord. Let my whole being bless the Lord. Praise the Lord. At this time, I invite any children or children at heart to come forward. So they are created, 
and they share this earth. Some of them we might wish didn't share the earth with us, but they're here. And so, are there ways that animals can rely on each other? That they need each other? Can you think of any examples where an animal has to rely on another? For food? Yeah, so there's the, the circle of life, you know, the food chain. But then there are other animals, like certain birds that could kind of clean the teeth of crocodiles. <laughs> um, and, and that's known as a symbiotic relationship, that the bird does something for the crocodile, the crocodile keeps the bird safe and gives it food. And how do we fit in? We can also rely on them for food. And do we have any responsibility to them? Like, do we have an importance in choices that we make that help to keep them safe? Preservation, yeah. And so maybe you've probably seen things about not throwing trash in the ocean because of all the terrible things, because it's bad in general, but because of all the terrible things that it does to those who live in the ocean. So, as people of faith, we say that God created everything, the earth and everything that is in it. That includes the whales and the ants and us and the plants and the mountains waters that everybody needs and we find our place in it and we listen for God who calls us to care for creation. So we join me in the prayer. Dear God, thank you for all of your creatures, the ones that are wonderful and the ones that are weird, the ones we like and maybe even the ones that we wish weren't around. You create them in all of their diversity. And you create us in all of our diversity. Help us to show care for your creation by the ways that we treat all life and one another, the ways that we help plants to grow and animals to grow, and the choices that we make to not make it harder for them to live. Help us to remember that you created us with love and with great purpose. We give you thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining me. You can go back to your seats. Penny, this is Aziza, she and I got along really well. 
Uh, she joked around that she was going to adopt me and that we were going to be twin siblings. <laughs> um, this is Kim. And then the person taking the photo is Tina. And David was not there because we, uh, earlier that day, we went on a sea life tour and he gets very seasick even if he takes medication. So he decided to stay back right, right from the sea life trip to here. <laughs> Killing time. There was, there was a lot of traveling. You could really only get places by driving or flying, and we didn't fly, so we drove everywhere. Um, so when we were traveling, I was either reading American Sniper or listening to The Wall. And The Wall is about an hour and a half, so it, it's really nice to eat up a bunch of time. So these are pictures um, from Anchorage to from when we were driving from Anchorage to Denali National Park, and even on the drive-in, the photos were really, really breathtaking. I believe this is when we were in the park. Yes, so this is the river by our campground, Savage River. Um, we were less than 100 yards away, so in the evenings what we would do is we would go down and walk along the river. There are all types of moose trails um, that we would walk on. And on the days that we had longer hikes, we'd go and put our feet in only for about, only for a little while. It was a glacially fed, so it was a little chilly to say the least. This is great example of what it was like all the time. If you can't read my watch, uh, it says 9.50, so almost 10 o'clock, and this is how light it was outside. Um, when I was in the airport, I realized that I forgot a flashlight, and I thought it was gonna be a large problem. I was very wrong. It was like this all the time. We went to bed at 10.30 one night, and it was still light outside. I woke up, early in the morning to go to the bathroom, and it was light outside. <laughs> so this is the first day, uh, first full day, in uh, Tanana National Park. Um, we hiked uh, Mount Margaret, and this is, if you can see, it's a very small trail. It's called, what David called a social trail, uh, which basically means that it's not official and nobody knows about it. Uh, so it's very small, very narrow, and very dense at the beginning. This is what it was like probably for the first 50 to 100 yards, uh, ducking through a uh, thick brush and trying not to sprain an ankle. This is, um, uh, this is after all the vegetation had cleared away. Um, that's what all this is, the really thick vegetation and brush, and after that it was all, for the most part it was like this, uh, rocky and very, very low vegetation. And it was also fairly steep. This is, a good example. this is where we stopped for lunch, and it was very windy, as you can tell by my hat and my face. <laughs> that is Mount Denali from where we ate lunch. The pictures got better um, the farther we went up. Alright, so this is the view from the top of, um, uh, so this is what it looks like at the top of Mount Margaret. And we were told by David that there was um, uh, an elevation marker for the highest point and that his son, Daniel, always took people up there, but his son Daniel wasn't there, so we had to explore for it ourselves. And you can't really see it, but there's a rock, a rectangular rock right here. And that's where myself and Kim thought the uh, location marker would be. Um, and when we got to the rock, we saw this. Um, 
I took this from far away through binoculars, but if you can't tell, these are antlers. There was a caribou laying behind the rock, um, hiding or taking shelter from the wind. So we went up and we saw this, and I thought that's really weird because a caribou would be standing way above that rock. And so we went around over in here, if the picture continued, actually, we went, we were probably right here when we saw the caribou. And we hadn't got the talk yet that said, that told us the caribous were not um, dangerous to people, that they were very relaxed. So we walked away immediately. <laughs> and Kim was, I think, a lot more worried than I was. Is he going to attack us? <laughs> and my best answer was, I have no idea. <laughs> um, this is um, another caribou. This is, it's a little bit smaller than the caribou we saw, uh, but the picture doesn't do it justice. Caribou are, uh, are a bit larger than deer, but their racks are huge. Like I said, we uh, put our feet in the river, um, but it was very cold. Um, one time uh, we did put our feet in for like a mini ice bath, and it was eight minutes of not fun because <laughs> in a normal ice bath, the water is still, so your feet go numb. But since it was a river and it was fairly fast moving, um, your feet don't go numb. This is, um, we woke up this one morning and there was a moose outside the bathrooms with the running water where we went in the mornings to brush our teeth. And there were two, two bull moose. You can only see the one in this picture. Oh. I guess I didn't include the other one, sorry. But uh, <laughs> this is later that day. Um, the second day we went on a hike to Horseshoe Lake. Um, this is the view from the lake. Um, we didn't get to see the horseshoe shape just because we were in kind of a time crunch. Um, here is a very large beaver dam um, at one end of the lake. So this is, um, uh, I think it's every hour on the hour they do a dog sled presentation. Um, this is, the lady is riding, it's not a dog sled. It's just a cart with wheels. It's just pretty much a cart, so they don't destroy the dog sled on the gravel. Um, but interesting fact, they uh, during the winters, they only use uh, dog sleds to get around from place to place. They don't use uh, ATVs or anything because they break down. Um, but they found that with the dogs, uh, they don't break down. And as a bonus, uh, they keep you extra warm. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end they let the dogs run back to their uh to their little shelters on their own. Some went and some did not. <laughs> this is a picture at the end of this day, or at the end of that day. Um as you can see they're all standing by the river walking along. This was um a bit farther down, I want to say maybe a half mile from where our camp was, if you um, went down to the river and took a right. Um, but yeah, it's, I think, I think that's Mount Margaret in the background. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, there I am. I skipped a lot of rocks. Um, so our third day was our service day, and I don't have any pictures um, of it, but basically what we're doing is we were weeding, um, and it may sound uh, not very useful, but where they hike, or where they walk the dogs, uh, the dog sled dogs, they uh, there's this plant called fireweed or no foxtail, and it's poisonous to the dogs because if they eat it, the seed gets stuck in their throat and, uh, and it gets infected, and they can actually die if they eat it. And then the other part of the day was. We were collecting seeds 
from the plant that they wanted to plant more of around the park. Um, when we, had, we actually ended up splitting into two groups and we had a little competition and the two groups were 23 and under and the really old people. <laughs> <laughs> but the, 20, the, the older group of people had more people so the younger group of people lost and we had to be dishes again. <laughs> so this is this is our this is the day we hiked the Savage Alpine Trail, and it sounds really intimidating, but the river by our campground was called Savage River, that's so why it's called the Savage Alpine Trail. Um, this was a little river right by by right at the start of the trail. Um, while we were stopped there, three people came back. Um, very scared, uh, and that's because they saw a grizzly bear um, on the trail a little ways ahead, and they decided that it was not worth hiking the rest of the trail, which is reasonable, believe it or not. Um, so we decided to hike the rest of the trail, and then we just made a lot of noise to scare off the bear. Because that's how they tell you to talk a lot and be loud, and I'm um, uh, that's how you'll scare away the bears because they're actually afraid of people. But if you walk up on them and you startle them, that's when they attack. And the first charge is apparently a bluff charge. Well, they'll just get really close and try and scare you away. But apparently the second charge is a bear attack. You're supposed to curl up in a little ball and play dead. Um, but I didn't want to be able to tell the difference. I didn't want to be able to come back and say, yeah, there's a difference <laughs> from experience. Uh, this is higher up on the Savage Alpine Trail. Um, this is, as we were looking out, uh, Mount Murray was to the right of us, and the Savage River was in between us, in between us and Mount Margaret. And this was um, towards the top of I don't even know which mountain this was, um, but basically the trail didn't go all the way up to the top, but I wanted to climb all the way up to the top, and so Kim was nice enough to go with me, and David let us or let me climb it, and um, uh, it was at the top. I think I have pictures, but this is this. Hold on a second. Um, at the top, it was very rock. It was all loose rock. So it got a little tricky, and I had to take my time because I didn't feel like sliding down the mountainside and breaking my ankle or breaking a leg or something. Uh, but the view from the top was really nice. Uh, so these are kind of jumping around a bit. These are blueberries. Um, they were everywhere. Like we would stop and put, pick blueberries for a half hour, and there would still be a ton of blueberries left wherever we picked. And then we used them, the ones we didn't eat right away, uh, we used for blueberry pancakes and stuff like that. All right, so this is, um, this is the nicer part. There's still moss and large rocks to hold on to. Um, this is at the top of the Savage Alpine Trail. And then this is the very peak. And if you can't really see it, but it's very, it's all rock. There's no vegetation. It's all just loose rock, and it's a mess up there. And then, normally the trail comes right along, and actually you go up through here and come back down, and it's really cool. Um, because you get the feeling like you're on the top excuse me, of a very high mountain, and there's kind of like, um, it's hard to describe, but there's large rocks on either side, and you almost feel like you're in Lord of the Rings. It was really cool. This is at the end of the day. Um, it was very rainy most of the time, except for the first day. Um, and so at the end of the day, I took this picture, and I don't know if you guys can see it, but there's actually a rainbow right here. Um, oh, fun fact, Denali is only visible one out of, I think it's three or four days. 
Um, and that's because it is so large that it makes its own weather. These are grizzly bears. I did not take this picture. Um, I stole some pictures from Anthony. Um, but this is when we were inside a bus. We were, um, this is the day we took a bus trip into the park and we, uh, we saw a bunch of wildlife. Um, we saw, so this is, there's mountain bear, club number one, and club number two. And we were probably 300 yards away. Uh, this is a bunch of caribou. Um, if you notice, this one has a collar. Uh, I think they track the, uh, the herds, uh, just, and they track, I think it's uh, the head, the head male. So this is, after we went, we stayed in Denali for a week, we went to Seward, and this is a view of the mountain behind our hostel uh, from Seward the day we got there. This is a picture of the hostel. This is much nicer than the first hostel we stayed in. Uh, the first hostel uh, looked like an abandoned motel. Uh, it was called the Moby, the Moby Dick Hostel. And we, uh, one of the people, one of the daughters um, who helped run it, she gave a presentation on how she hiked Mount Tanali when she was 15 with her dad, uh, which was very cool to see. While we were in Seward, we did a, we took a sea life tour. Um, this is the one that David did not go on because he gets violently seasick. Um, yeah, this is one of the islands. We were in the Gulf of Alaska. And um, it's a national, it's another national park, I forget the name. Uh, so this is uh, one of the icebergs that we saw. Uh, if you notice, it's blue. And apparently, the color of the ice is dependent on the weather. So if it's cloudy, it looks blue. But if we would have went there on a sunny day, then it just really looks like a regular white. Uh, this is a bald eagle that we saw earlier in the trip. So there were, we watched a humpback whale for 15, 20 minutes. And while we were watching it, it actually breached. Um, I didn't get a picture. This is another one of Anthony's pictures uh, towards the end. But it was it was really cool to see. Uh, it's a lot different than seeing it on TV. I on some of the islands, they have it's called a keyhole. Um, it's where some a larger rock juts out of the rest of the island and has these little keyholes. Uh, but they're all over the place, but they're really cool to see. Uh, this is a bunch of sea lions hanging out on the rocks. And what we found out is that they actually walk on their front flippers and they launch themselves out of the water, which I saw at the aquarium that we visited. But it's really weird to see something that large just kind of launch itself out of the water. So this is, this is a gut truck in Seward, which is very, very good. Um, on the trip, we had um, people with various allergies, nut allergies, um, some were vegetarian. Uh, so there wasn't a lot of meat that we had, and anything, any of the uh, carbs we had was gluten-free or uh, whole wheat. And the only meat that we'd had so far was fish in, in the entire trip. and so. I went and I stopped by before lunch um, at this place, Hamjang, and if you can't see it, it says Aloha via Seward, and I don't know if it's Mexican food or Hawaiian food, but it was really good. <laughs> I got it. it was, I don't even remember, it was, it was like two pork tacos and it just had some pork and some lettuce and tomato and some hot sauce. And it might have just been the fact that I hadn't had anything with meat in it for over a week. It was really good. And I actually have 
a sticker of this that I put on one of my water bottles. <coughs> so, do you guys have any questions? I covered a lot of them kind of fast. Any questions? No? All right. Thank you very much. Amazing pictures to see. Amazing trip and experience. When you think of wilderness places, what comes to mind? Do you think of desolate places, places where there is less or no access to the comforts that many of us take for granted? Do you think of places of danger? Or perhaps, do you envision places that are open for discovery? Does wilderness evoke an image of peace and quiet? Depending on your experiences, any one of those thoughts or something else entirely may come to mind. The Bible speaks of wilderness. Jesus began his ministry by going into the wilderness. And throughout his ministry, there were times when he would leave a crowd to go to a deserted place. For those of us who like to depend on the comforts of home, wilderness spaces can be frightening. They make us vulnerable and aware that we are not as in charge as we think we are. Wilderness places open us to places within us where we might not be so confident or assured that we are safe. At the very least, they push us to be comfortable in our own company and in our own skin. Even as we may be aware that we need to depend on others with us to survive or have needs met. No wonder there are people who will avoid wilderness as much as possible. But on the other hand, these are the same reasons why others leave what is familiar behind to go to these places. Outside of routines, we become aware of a bigger world we might otherwise not know. In the middle of nowhere, we give up pretenses and preconceived notions of what we should be or what we should do. We are pushed to see how we fit in God's wider creation. Psalm 104 is a praise for God's creation and creative spirit. In these verses that you heard earlier, the psalmist imagines God who clothes the world with light and color. From mountains, waters run down to cover the land and form oceans and other bodies of water. Unimaginably large sea creatures play in the deep. Tiny flowers are nourished by drops of dew. By God's set boundaries, the waters are held back from covering everything so that plants can spring forth from the ground. Animals of all kinds make their homes on the mountains, across grasslands, in marshy areas, and in the forest, as we saw. Wild, creeping things and Timid creatures all have a place and depend on God for food and other needs. If we are open to experiencing it, wilderness places allow us to not only be aware of how fragile life can be or how vulnerable we are, we are opened as well to see how much God cares for us and how beautiful a world in harmony truly is. 
those who are native Alaskans, live in a way that is closer to the earth than many of us typically live. Some of the phrases that the psalmist uses might seem out of touch with the world as we understand it or how we understand God. We don't think of water running in terror. And if holding back floods were simply a matter of God's command, then why have we seen so many images of homes and possessions, lives impacted by recent storms and flash flooding? And if the earth produces good work just by God's word, why do we have so many images of California fires that are raging out of control year after year, eating everything in its path? We live in a world of beauty, but we also live with a reality that bad things can happen even to good people. And natural disasters can destroy everything necessary to support life, whether it comes in the form of storm or tornado or volcano or earthquake or other so-called acts of God. We don't think of the earth trembling or mountains smoking as literal responses to God's creative act. We don't see these things as God's judgment or collective punishment. We know that people who work to and labor all day don't always have the resources they need for themselves or their families when they come home at night. Some of the things in the psalm don't ring true to our experience if we take them word for word. But then again, maybe the psalmist and those who heard these songs of praise didn't have such a literal view either. The poetry in these verses speaks of God's presence, and we can affirm that, even if we don't think of a literal hand of God reaching down and touching us. We join our voices in praise to acknowledge that God is the source of all life, and leads us to places of balance and beauty. As we depend on God, we remember that as we depend on the resources of the earth, the earth depends on us to remember the first biblical commands that God gave to humanity to be stewards of the earth, to care for it even as we fill it. We are entrusted with responsibility to maintain the balance of our natural resources, to take food without stripping away entire species by removing their sources of food. In wilderness places, we have a glimpse of the world in its original created order. Instead of seeing these places as desolate, undeveloped, mostly worthless, we have vision that wherever we find ourselves, we are not in the middle of nowhere, but in the middle of somewhere God has created, somewhere life sprang forth in its unique variables. Wherever we find ourselves, in Alaska, in a backyard garden, even in the middle of the city, we are invited to pay attention and to appreciate the life that is around us. To give thanks to God who created with word, with action, with love. We are blessed to continue the spirit of creation by our awe, our wonder, and our work. To preserve what we have received and to share that, blessings, that blessing with others. Let it be so.
For Jesus, a life lived for others was the only life consistent with God's reign. The church exists to increase among us the love of God and neighbor, and to build within us the deep <coughs> conviction that we are beloved, valued people of worth. It is to this high mission that we devote our offerings for ministry in this community and throughout God's world. and see that you are good. What well, we have tasted and you are truly good. As a token of our gratitude and a reflection of our devotion, we give back to you from our abundance. Multiply the gifts of our hands that we may double what we could do alone. To the glory and service of Jesus. Amen.
O God, creator of all life, we are mindful that every breath that we receive is a gift from you. Thank you for the opportunity to praise your name, to join together in worship, to be part of a community that supports one another. By your call, we are mindful of the needs around us, needs of people who cry out for shelter, for protection, for basic necessities, and most of all, for love. We hear the cries of creation that groans under the weight of the choices that we make. Empower us to make good decisions. We are mindful of a world that is so often in conflict. Warring nations, warring tribes, violence in the streets around us, and we pray for peace. We pray for leaders, locally, nationally, globally. Empower them to make good decisions. Empower us as your people to live out your commands and to live according to your calling. Restore us when we fall astray from your path. Strengthen us for whatever journeys we face. All this we pray, along with all creation. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let us join in singing just the first verse of God of the earth, the sky, the sea.